say good afternoon, Nathy Creek. Let's all stand together. We're so happy you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. We get another amazing opportunity to praise the Lord and to get into the Word. Let's all worship together.
can move mountains. God can move mountains. Sing praise, sing praise. For He's our salvation. He's our salvation.
Lord, what a joy it is to be able to stand here in your sanctuary, not ashamed of our failures or our sins, but Lord, you, by your precious blood, as we just sang, Lord, we can come before you, not based on our righteousness, but upon your great mercy. Lord, how thankful we are that you're the forgiver of sins and that you do receive us like the prodigal with arms open wide. You love us. Even while we were yet sinners, you demonstrated your love dying for the sins of the world. I know, Lord, that the enemy, the evil one, would wanna whisper in people's ears that, you're not, that they're not worthy enough to come to church or be in a church setting. Um, but Lord, we all acknowledge none of us are worthy. Uh, we fall way short, not even close. But you alone are worthy and you receive glory and honor. And because of your great love, you receive us. And the Bible, Lord, your word reminds us that you inhabit the praises of your people, that you dwell in this place. Lord, what a privilege to stand in your presence, to know that you're here and that not only are you here, but you love us. Lord, I pray that that would be something that everybody can know, that Lord, your love reaches even to the heavens and your mercy endures forever. Lord, that your grace is sufficient for all of us. We're thankful for that. And now, Lord, because of that, we also want to learn from your word and pray that you'd sharpen our minds, help us to receive your word, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, your word, the living word, the powerful word. We look to that now. Pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, book of Daniel, chapter nine. Why don't you grab your Bible, turn there with me. Uh, Daniel chapter nine. The Bible's full of prophecy, predictions of the future. Daniel 9 is one of the greats, the true great prophecies. Did you know that uh, popular mechanics in 1949, they said computers in the future may weigh mo no more than one and a half tons. <laughs> that was a prediction. Uh, that's the actual cover of the, that. Uh, it's just funny. Uh, 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 Thomas Watson, who was the chairman of IBM in 1943, he said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Wow, he sure looks like a smart guy, but uh, <laughs> Ken Olson, president and chairman and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, he said, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. <laughs> Who said this? Six, 640 kilobytes ought to be enough for anybody. Anybody know who said that? Anybody? Bill Gates. Bill Gates said that in 1981, uh, back in the Commodore 64 days, I guess, or whatever. Or that was, that, yeah, anyway, probably wrong product there. Um, but uh, other predictions that cracked me up throughout, I mean, I, I've got a little running collection of these, but these are some of my favorites. This one dude named Fred Smith wrote a paper at Yale University in one of his classes. And on the paper, the term paper, the professor wrote this. The concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn a better grade than a C, the idea must be feasible. Well, Fred Smith's paper was proposing a reliable overnight delivery service. Smith went on to uh, found FedEx Corporation uh, and actually showed that he could do it. I love that. Um, who said this? Uh, Gary Cooper. He said, I'm, I'm just glad I'll, uh, it'll be Clark Gable who's falling on his face and not Gary Cooper. Why did he say that? Gary Cooper on his decision to not take the leading role in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Oops. Um, finally, Business Week, August 2nd, 1968. They said, with over 50 foreign cars already on sale here, the Japanese auto industry isn't likely to carve out a big slice of the US market. <laughs> Oops, little thing called Toyota uh, proved that wrong. Anyway, it's just funny, whenever people try to make uh, prophecies or, or predictions, we're pretty bad at it. Um, some of the guys, you know, Nostradamus kind of thing, or, or maybe George Orwell, speaking of, you know, uh, 100, before, 100 years before, 1984, he predicted, and he got it about as good as anybody. He got 35% of his predictions right. Good for him. But what's so amazing, and people refuse to sit up and take note, the Bible has tons of prophecies, and the ones that are supposed to have happened by now, 100%. There are still some prophecies yet to happen that are in our future, but the Bible is accurate. And God is the one who knows the beginning from the end, the scriptures say. 
and he sees it all. And that's what's so cool. And I love the Bible for that. There might not be any greater scripture, in my opinion, and prophecy than this one here found in Daniel chapter nine, verses 20 through 27. That's our text for the day, and I wanna share with you a thing called the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. It's huge, and it's important. And you say, well, how could one prophecy be more important than the other? Uh, maybe you're right, but this one is important because it's profound prophecies about Jesus, both his first coming and his second coming and the rapture of the church. It's all in this one prophecy of Daniel. Um, and uh, by the way, Daniel's praying in his, in his you know, house to the Lord, and he's praying, praying, fasting, praying, and we studied that prayer on Wednesday night. It's a beautiful prayer. If you missed that, I mean, the prophecy of Daniel 9 is awesome, but the prayer of Daniel 9 is also hugely important, and we looked at that on Wednesday night. If you missed that in our study, um, you definitely wanna go back and see the prayer of Daniel. But while he's praying this prayer, and what's he praying about? Forgiveness for the sins of, of Israel. They were in captivity for 70 years. That's what he was praying about. Lord, Jeremiah the prophet said, we're gonna be in captivity for 70 years. Lord, show me, talk to me about these 70 years. Like he's seeking the Lord about 70 years. And the Lord says, oh yeah? I'm gonna show you about 70 weeks. Weeks? Years? Which one's better? Well, check this out. Let's read. Daniel chapter nine, verse 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of God, that's Jerusalem. Yea, verse 21, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That's when you know your prayer is kind of entering into a little special mode, wouldn't you say? You're praying all of a sudden, <laughs> like what does an angel sound like when, <laughs> I don't know, I, what, you got the angel flying swiftly and then all of a sudden, <laughs> the angel touches Daniel. This is a radical experience Daniel has right around the evening oblation, verse 22. And the angel Gabriel, he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, his prayers, the commandment came forth that I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Wow, Daniel gets this great word. The first thing is, I'm here, when you started praying, you could almost say, God sent me, Gabriel, the angel, the messenger angel to come and give you this radical skill and understanding and pr prophecy and envisions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that to you. And then he throws in a little freebie. And I love this and I can't read on without mentioning. I love that the angel Gabriel says to him, Daniel, by the way, did you know you're greatly beloved? Isn't that something? You know, Daniel, this poor dude, when you think about his life, his parents were slaughtered on the hills of Jerusalem. He was dragged by King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, hundreds of miles from his home, and he was raised in, the, in Babylon as a, cap, a captive. And he had a few rough days. I mean, like, remember when Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't prophesy or tell me my dream, I'm gonna chop your body into pieces and make your house a pile of manure. Like, that's a tough day at the office. Or how about when he was praying, so they threw him in the lion's den? Another tough day at the office. Like Daniel was just there in Babylon in captivity and he's praying, oh Lord, how long these 70 years? And, and I love that the Lord says, by the way, Daniel, do you know through the angel Gabriel, you're greatly beloved. Now some of you, now I gotta admit, I'm not a squishy, mishy guy. In fact, I, I'm probably about as sensitive as a brick and that's a problem. Uh, it really is a problem. Um, but I have to say, even me, even I notice this is kind of special that God would say to poor Daniel, who's probably tired and getting old, and he says, Daniel, you're greatly beloved. Do you know if you're a Christian here? Because some of you might be saying, well, good for Daniel. At least God loves him. But don't forget, if you're a believer, if you've accepted Christ, you're a child of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. The Lord's gonna say to you, the Christian, when you stand before him, he's gonna say, you are greatly beloved of God. That's that's hard to even fathom. I wonder if you and I might even be a little shocked when that moment comes because we're gonna say, you know, you, in your mind, like when you stand before the throne, God's gonna look at you, you know, like, oh dear, 
What's that smell? Smoke? Yeah, well, at least you're here, you know, you made it to heaven. Um, but, but some of us, we have to realize, do you know right now God loves you amazingly? Anyway, I love that. Before he gets this massive vision, by the way, Daniel, you're greatly beloved. Anyway, and then he gives him the vision and the prophecy. That's pretty cool. So what's this prophecy? Well, that's where we pick up in verse 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, this world leader that's coming, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. <clears throat> and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're like, Brett, this is why I don't read the Bible. <laughs> what did you just read? Like, come on. And, and I admit, the King James is a little tricky on this one as we're reading, you know, uh, three score and two years. You're like, what is that? Uh, well, that's 62 years. Some of us kind of grew up with the King James and so it comes kind of more naturally. But if you didn't, you're like, what did we just read? And even if you read in your more modern translations, it's hard enough. But, you know, normally, by the way, I would say most Bible prophecy is pretty simple and easy, but Daniel's kind of unique, the book of Daniel, because... Remember Daniel said, the, the Lord told Daniel, seal up the words of your book until the time of the end. In other words, the Bible prophecy given in Daniel would be hard to understand until they get closer to the end of time. And it was told, it was told twice in chapter 12 of Daniel, seal up the words. But I believe we're seeing the unsealing and, and we're, we're understanding the way this is all gonna shake out as we retrospectively look and say, wow, what, what, what's he talking about here? So we have some work to do. Let's figure out what this 70 weeks of Daniel is all about. First of all, um, you gotta note the very first part of this. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Question, who would be Daniel's people? Anybody? The Jews, right? So that's the first thing we need to establish. The Jews and upon thy holy city, what's the holy city of Daniel? Right, not Mecca, not Dundee, <laughs> not Portland. Jerusalem is the, the holy city of the Jews. So the reason I, you say, but that's obvious. Well, not so much. There's people that try to take this 70 weeks prophecy and they try to say, well, that's for the American church or that was for um, a group of people in history or that was this or that, but it's not about, you know, and they try to ascribe this to other people. This prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel from the beginning to the end of what we just read is for Jews and for Jerusalem. Very important to know that. Now, the word there, 70 weeks. Let me tell you quickly what that is, and then we'll show you that in a minute. First of all, quickly, 70 weeks, your newer translations, like I believe your NIV, it says 77s are determined upon Israel. 77s. Um, well, is it weeks or is it sevens? Well, it's, it's more like sevens. Um, the word weeks, it was used because in 1611, King James English, it's something we don't do anymore, but they could use the word week in the sense of a week of seven days or a week of seven years. And the word that is often used there, there's a, there's a couple words associated with this that we'll talk about here in a second. But basically what you need to know is 77 year periods. Now, if you do the math of that, anybody a great math petition? How many years is 77 year periods? Anybody? 490, yes, yeah, I mean like, okay, carry the one, yeah, okay, 409, got it. Um, now, so, so just so you know, right now out of the gate, we're talking about 490 year period determined upon Israel, the Jews, and the city of Jerusalem, that's kind of the main thing. And we'll talk about the 70 and the word weeks here in a second, but what's the whole point of these 490 years? Well, that's where verse 24 comes in, the rest of it, 
that says, here's what's gonna be accomplished by the passing of these 490 years. At the end of that time, there's gonna be six things that are listed. Some would say seven, I'll show you what I mean. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about this. Why 70 weeks or, or why 490 years? And what's the point? Well, it's, it's in order to do this. Number one, why 70 weeks? Number one, it says here in verse 24, to finish the transgression. What transgression? Okay, if we're talking about the transgression of the Jews, you kind of have to realize he's talking about the greatest of transgressions. The word transgression is another word for sin, but it's a, it's, it's a sin that's specifically against the Lord, a transgression against the Lord. What was it that the Jews did against the Lord? The number one sin the Jews would do is they'd reject the Messiah, Jesus. And you see, this is the transgression that needs to be finished. It needs to be done away with. Um, how do I know that? Well, there's a bunch of scriptures, um, um, by the way, um, and it's linked to the second point here, to make an end of sin. That's the second thing. But see those scriptures under, you know, finish the transgression. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, by the way. Um, and you can jot these down in your notes if you want. Um, Zechariah the prophet said a bunch about this transgression against uh, the Lord by the Jews. It says this, like in Zechariah twelve ten, when they look on me of whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. Who did the Jews pierce? They nailed Jesus to a cross. Now, before we get to uh, you know, sounding anti-Semitic, first of all, especially if you're a Jew here or watching online, um, God still loves the Jews. God still has a plan for the Jews. And the Jews weren't the only ones who nailed Jesus to the cross. We nailed Jesus to the cross with our sins, just for the record. But who was it that actually nailed the, the Romans did at the you know, hammering away of the Jews saying, crucify him, we will not have this man rule over us. The great transgression is when they, they looked, they'll look on Jesus with his scars and say, what? In fact, Zechariah 13, one, that's the second scripture there. Um, it says, on that day, there'll be a fountain opened in the house of David, in the house of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from their sins and uncleanness. See, these first two points, there's coming a day where the Jews, there'll be a finishing of their rejecting of the Messiah and, an, and, a, and a cleansing of their sins. That has not yet happened, by the way. Um, the final verse, Zechariah 13, 6, it says, and, on one, and one of the Jews will say unto him, what are these wounds in your hands? And Jesus will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. There's coming a time where the Jews will go, what? We've rejected the Messiah that we were all looking for. They're gonna come to that realization that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah of the predictions of the Old Testament. They don't know that even to this day. Um, what else is gonna be accomplished by these? Well, there's, the list goes on. We'll try to make this snappy. Um, number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Um, number four, these are all things that are gonna be the, 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 what's, what the 70 weeks are gonna accomplish. Number four, to bring in an everlasting righteousness. And let me ask you a question. Are these things done yet? None of them are done yet. Um, we don't see an everlasting righteousness in the world. Um, we don't see the Jews finishing their sins. By the way, as a supporter of Israel, sometimes people misinterpret my support for the Jews and my support for Israel with me somehow thinking they're perfect. Um, do I think the Jews are perfect? No, they're sinful just like you and me. They're sinners. And, and if you go to Jerusalem, you'll see sinners. And if you go to Tel Aviv, you'll see 70% of the population of Jews in, in Tel Aviv, 70% of them are atheists. Um, the Jews have not uh, been reconciled uh, largely. Now, there are a few Jews who've accepted Christ. Uh, very small. You're like, I know Jews for Jesus. You know, Messianic churches, some of them, uh, some of the Messianic churches are a little crazy, I gotta say, uh, doctrinally. You gotta know that. Um, some of them are not. But um, if a Jew becomes a Christian, Ephesians says, Ephesians says it's a new man. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's the church, there's the Jews, and there's Gentiles. But when you become a Christian, Jew or Gentile, you become part of the new man, the church of Jesus Christ. Read Ephesians chapter two. So this is all still in the future. Number, number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. This is where some people make this two points. To seal up the vision, number, number five. To seal up prophecy, number six. I like to put them together because they sort of go together. Um, there's gonna be a sealing up of the visions of Daniel 
and the prophecies of Daniel that's coming at the same time when this 490 years, the 70 weeks, when they're sealed, that's coming. And then lastly, it says here in our scripture, to anoint the most holy. That can mean two things, and there's argument. Is is it anointing Jesus as the king over Jerusalem? Well, that is gonna happen when this comes to fruition. Um, But but most scholars that know the, the Hebrew language, they believe this is talking actually not as much about the king of kings, Jesus, it's talking about the holy place in Jerusalem or the holy of holies. Remember Ezekiel 41 through 46, we went through the millennial kingdom temple that's gonna be built. And there's dimensions on what that temple's gonna look like. We looked at that just a few months ago. Um, Some people believe that's what it's talking, gonna anoint the most holy place, the holy of holies, when this all comes down. So here's what you gotta get. What are we talking about? Well, when you read your Bible and you know the way this all shakes out, we're talking about a time we already know about. It's called the kingdom. Um, It's called the millennial kingdom. There's a time coming where Christ is gonna come and do all these things. And it's, it's his second coming, the second coming of Christ. Revelation 19, where Christ comes uh, riding on the horse with 10,000s of his saints and he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives and he will from that point on rule and reign. Now here's the thing. Some people, maybe you've heard pastors say, we live in the kingdom now. There is no future kingdom. We're living in the kingdom. Um, it's called dominion theology or kingdom now and sadly there's a lot of people that kind of believe that. Um, if that were true, do you see any of these things really accomplished yet? If, if I had to believe that I live in the kingdom right now, um, I'd be really depressed. In fact, I heard this one Kingdom Now pastor recently, a couple years ago actually, he uh, gave a teaching and he said, you know, the world is getting better. Things are getting better. I was like, wow, this guy should be a used car salesman, man. Like this, <laughs> whew, that's a big sell right there. Especially, I'd like to see if he's still saying that now after a couple of years, COVID years and, and what's going on in the world. Is it really getting better? Because if you're trying to convince me that, I'm really depressed right about now, if this is better. Um, We're not living in the kingdom. Well, Jesus said the kingdom of God is among you. Well, he's talking about um, he's the king of the kingdom, Jesus, and we're the people of the kingdom. But didn't Jesus also tell us to pray when he taught us how to pray? Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's that prayer for? This, the thing we just listed. um, This is when Jesus comes and his kingdom is established. So that's the thing you gotta kind of start with. Um, The 70 weeks or 490 years that are determined upon Israel and Jerusalem, these are gonna show us, these years are gonna show us how and when the Lord's gonna usher in his kingdom and his second coming. And he's gonna do all these things we've just listed. It's gonna be glorious. Are you guys with me? Good, okay. So you say, okay, got it. Well then what in the world is a week? And how can you say that it's 70 weeks? And and, uh, Because I don't know if I, I think you're doing some fancy stuff there, trying to make it work. Uh, If you don't believe me about the week in the translation of the King Jimmy, you can look this up, Genesis 29. Remember the story in Genesis 29, Uncle Laban and Jacob, and he wants to marry Rachel. Remember that story? This is where the word week is used in the context of seven years where um, you know, Jacob works seven years for Rachel and Uncle Laban, he's kind of a trickster and he, he heavily, heavily veils Leah. And uh, Leah, the Bible says, made your eyes hurt when you looked at her. That's what the Bible says, that's not me. <laughs> Poor Leah. <clears throat> so, so Laban heavily veils Leah and then you, know, you do, you don't, you, well, you won't, you're married. So they go to bed and consummate the marriage. Jacob wakes up the next morning, he's like, the, pulls the covers back, ah, he's married. <laughs> He's married to poor Leah. Now, by the way, the Lord blesses Leah and she ends up you know, having all kinds of kids and it's quite a story. But do you remember Uncle J- Jacob saying, Uncle Laban, you've, what have you done? Oh, he said, it's not my custom to marry off the, the, the younger daughter before the older. So there you go. He said, but if you work seven more years, now this is where this verse, uh, you say, what does this have to do with anything? Well, this is where the verse in Genesis 29 says, if you work for seven more years for Rachel, when you fulfill her week, then you can marry her. So this is, this is there, you know, where it, it's kind of shows where the translation can use a week of seven years or a week of seven days. But again, what you also need to know, it's more importantly, and this is, I should have probably just gone straight to this. The Hebrew word here for week is shabuah in the Greek, or pardon me, the Hebrew, which is a unit of measure. 
It's not a, a length of days, okay? That's important. It's a unit of measure. So it's like the word dozen in the English. The word dozen, when I say dozen, do we always have to talk about eggs? Well, no, you can talk about a dozen eggs, but you can also talk about a dozen cars parked in the parking lot, which I'm sure that's all we have out there. Um, or, or a dozen people or a dozen churches or a dozen, whatever. Um, in the same way, when, when you use this Hebrew word, Shabuah, you're always talking about seven, Shabua. Um, there's another word associated, you, if you're doing a deep dive into this, the word heptad is also used in different uh, you know, masculine forms and what have you, but heptad or shabua, it's just a unit of seven. So the word weeks, as far as seven days, is not anywhere in this text, in the original. So we're talking about a series of sevens, and, um, and as we look at the, the context of this, we're talking about years, uh, weeks of years, I should say. So you've got seven seven-year periods, or, you know, 70 seven-year periods, I should say. Uh, Brad, I'm confused. Well, let's do the math, since you all love math so much. So we got a week, or a Shabuah, a seven-year period. And 70 times seven, or 70 weeks times 70, uh, seven years uh, per week um, is 490 years. Do you guys see how we're doing that? I just want to make sure that's clear of how we're getting to this idea of 490 years. And uh, by the way, you know, um, all scholarship agrees with that. I'm just not just pulling this out of the blue, just, just so you can know. So this, this is the key. Now, how does this break down? Let, let's kind of spell this out. How do the 70 weeks uh, break down? What you have to do is sort of look at um, verses 25 through 27, and let's see what in the world's being said here. And this is where the language gets confusing. So I, I read it in King Jimmy. Let's go to the NIV and take a quick peek at that. And I think this will help bring a little clarity. Same passage, know and understand this. This is the big deal. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens, and it will be rebuilt with the streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will I destroy. The city and the sanctuary, um, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. Brett, that didn't help. <laughs> the NIV didn't help, sorry. Well, let's put Crayolas in here for a second. Uh, I, always, I always like crayons. Uh, okay, the things I just put colors in, these are the delineations of times that you need to know about. The blue, the seven sevens, that's the first chunk of the 490 years we gotta talk about. The 62 sevens is the second chunk, and the red is the third chunk. And then the green is a dividing of the red, okay? What do I mean by that? Okay, well, here's the deal. Question, when you read it in the NIV and it says seven sevens, how many years would that be out of our 490? Anybody wanna take a stab? Huh? 49, you're right, 49. Seven times seven is 49. Um, and so that's the first chunk to remember, the blue, 49 years. 62 sevens, now let's see who the real brainiacs are. How many years is that? 434. You guys get a, a reward? That's, like, that's easy. I'm like, oh, I had to get my calculator out for that one. So the, the orange there is, is 434 years. So you got 49 years, um, uh, as it turns out. And then you have 434 years. Uh, now, if we go to the red, this one's easy, one seven. That means seven years. So that's the next time chunk, seven years. And then the green chops the, that seven in half. What's half of seven? Three and a half. Ooh, we even can do fractions here at Athey Creek. Uh, I'm impressed. Yes. <laughs> 400. Now you say, okay, Brad, let's, let's, I'm still kind of confused. Well, let's, let's break it out in more of a, a way we can see it. The 70 weeks of Daniel, we're talking about 490 years. And the first delineation of time there was the 49 years. Um, and, and here's what that is, just so you know, because it defines it. It says from the 
the, the commandment and the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, is 49 years and 434 years, and then at the end of that, the Messiah will come. That's what it says in our text. Here's how that shakes out. The first 49 years, the, the commandment, by the way, did come. And we've talked about this dude a couple weeks ago. Um, after you know, the Babylonians, then the Medes and the Persians came, now Daniel's sitting there under the Medo-Persian Empire, but there was coming a day where a guy named Artaxerxes would give the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We know that date in history, March 14th, 445 BC. That's when that commandment came to the Jews um, that were in captivity like Daniel, there in Babylon. Suddenly the decree came, you Jews, why don't you go build your city again, your wall and your temple. That decree was March 14th, 445 BC. So if you would, the 490 years, the stopwatch begins, click. Now we're counting days and years and stuff. Um, and that happened on that day where the decree was given. So the, why, why 49 years? Well, that's how long it took the Jews to build and reconstruct the wall and the temple of Jerusalem. That's a, a delineation of time of the restoration of Jerusalem and Israel. That's the 49. But it says there it'll be, you know, uh, seven sevens and 62 sevens, then the Messiah, the Prince, will come. So we have to try to figure out, well, where's this 434 years fit in? Well, you just slam it right in there next to the 49. Um, 434 years, what, what happened? Well, after Jerusalem was restored and rebuilt, 40, 49 years into it, we enter into a season, a time that people call t several different things. They call it the silent years uh, or the intertestamental period. That is the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament where we don't have Bible writing about. Um, it's the silent years. That 434 years, as it turns out, is that time period. Now, all that to say, so far, we're, we're accounting for 483 years now, when we add the 49 to the 434. Are you guys still with me on that? So we're up to 483 years, which leaves out of the 70 weeks of Daniel, we, we've accounted for 69 of the 70, but there's a 70th week, a one more week of seven years left. And that's that little slice at the very end, the gray box, that is the seven year period. Um, now you say, okay, Brett, got it. Uh, so we only have seven uh, you know, years left. But some of you might be saying, wait a minute, Brett, I'm a little confused. Um, because um, you know, this, this, this doesn't make sense to me because you know, there, if there's another week left, what happened in that week? Like all the millennial kingdom and the return of Christ, that should have happened a long time ago if this is the way it folds out. But there's something that happened that, that makes the whole thing. This is what Daniel would have never been able to figure out. But we know what happened and we know how it's gonna roll. Because what happened? If you, if you do the math on this and you start with March 14th, 445 BC, the, the date that I gave you before, um, then as it turns out, it brings you forward as you add the 49 and the 434, if you add them together, the, it brings you to April 6th, 32 AD. You say, okay, well, great. You do the math on that. Um, what happened then? Well, that's just where the Bible amazes me and it's an incredible prophecy when you realize that brings you to the very day where Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a little donkey. That's powerful. You do the math. You know, if, you just, if, if the people would have just read the book of Daniel and really figured this out and say, man, when did they decree to go, go restore Jerusalem? And if they would have, they could have known the very day. Well, how do you know that, Brett? Jesus said that, didn't he? Um, jot this down. Let's take a break from our timeline just for a second. And on Palm Sunday, as Jesus was riding down the Mount of Olives on a little colt of a donkey, it says in uh, Luke 19, 41, it says, and when Jesus, he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it saying, if thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. In other words, you're gonna be dead by these enemies that are coming. And why? And it says, they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, there in Jerusalem. Because, and look what Jesus said, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. 
Well, how would they have known the time of thy visitation? Daniel chapter nine, verses 20 through 27. And that's the Jews' holy writings. It's not even the Gentiles' holy book. I mean, it is. But the Jews missed it. It says they were blind to the date. So that when Jesus was writing in and people were saying, Hosanna, save now, blessed is he who comes in the name of they should have said, this is it. He is the Messiah. But because they didn't know this and failed to read their Bible, if you would, um, they were blinded. And then what happened after they said, Hosanna, they, they cried out, crucify him. We will not have this man rule over us. They rejected Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, so Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks or 490 years, we, we see how it just brought us right today. That's, that's, that's the miraculous nature. But we still haven't figured out this final seven, 70th week or the last 70 years. And what is this? this well, you, you say, Brett, I don't know what happened after Jesus rode into Jerusalem for seven years. What happened? Well, that's the thing. Do you realize that the stopwatch we talked about, it stopped when they rejected Jesus the Messiah. Well, how do you know that, Brett? Do you remember in Daniel chapter two when we saw the statue, gold, silver, uh, br brass, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and legs of iron, feet part iron, part, cl part clay, and the toes that came out of the feet? Remember that, that whole thing? Do you remember the gap? There was a gap in that prophecy. Now let's see who can remember, because this, this is going back a few weeks. What was it that stopped the timing, that the stopwatch in Daniel 2, also in Daniel chapter 7? Why isn't Mussolini and Charlemagne and, and Hitler or other people who tried to conquer that part of the world, why aren't they listed in the kingdoms there? Um, there's a reason that we talked about, and, and there's a stopwatch that stops. Does anybody remember? What is the thing that makes the stopwatch stop and start? Anybody? Yes. The church age also... Um, the timepiece is Israel itself. You see, here's what happened. Israel ceased to exist. And whenever cease, Israel ceased to exist, the stopwatch stops. We saw that in Daniel 2. That's why we only go to the Roman Empire. Now, it's funny because in the last days, out of the old Roman Empire, which is today Europe, there's gonna come 10, 10 kings. And then the Bible says in the days of those kings, Christ is gonna come and set up his kingdom. So that's what we learned, if you remember, in Daniel chapter two. There was a gap, and the gap had to do with the existence of the nation Israel. And, and this is what we're seeing here. The stopwatch stops when they reject Jesus. Jesus dies and ascends, uh, raises up from the dead, goes into heaven. And what happens after that? The Romans crush Jerusalem in AD 70. They wipe out Jerusalem, drive the Jews out of Israel, and they're scattered all over the world. It's called the diaspora. Remember in Ezekiel, we read about how the Lord says, I'm gonna drive you from uh, this nation and you're gonna be scattered and you're gonna cease to exist as a nation. And that's why, correctly, we call this gap the church age. Because after the Jews rejected Jesus, guess who accepted Jesus? Largely, um, there were some Jews, of course, at the beginning, it was all Jews at the very beginning, but a very small group of Jews. But then the only people that actually really receive it would be the Gentiles. Do you remember Paul the apostle? He's called and the Lord says, I want you to minister to the Gentiles. And Paul's like, ah, that's great, Lord, but I want to minister to the Jews. The Lord said, nope, Gentiles. And Paul's like, Jews, Gentiles, Jews. Remember Paul would go try to minister to the Jews and every time they'd kill him or, what do you mean kill him? That's kind of once or fault, not with Paul. Remember they stoned him to death and he's under a pile of rocks and the Lord says, it's not your time, Paul. <laughs> Raises him up from the dead out of the pile of rocks and he has to go back and start teaching the Gentiles again. Every time he tried to do stuff with the Jews, they would hate him. But every time he'd go and say to the Gentiles, believe in Jesus, people were getting baptized by the thousands, saved, and the church age started to grow, the Gentile church. Um, and, and so the stopwatch has been stopped for a long time. And, and that's, that's what you have to understand, uh, the, the, ch the church age. Now, the church age is, is this time period that is a variable. We don't know how long this age is gonna be. There's no knowing this. And uh, what is it that's gonna be the mark? There is a mark that's gonna end the church age. Anybody wanna take a stab at that? The rapture of the church, that's correct. The end of the church age will be when the church is raptured. Um, and that makes sense. I, I think it makes sense. But, you know, but, but here's the thing. Um, some people believe the rapture of the church is going to be at different times. We'll talk about that in a second. But 
that when the church is done, the fullness of the Gentiles, as Romans 11 puts it, when that's all done, then the Lord's gonna turn back to the Jews and start that 70th week. And he's gonna un unfold the rest of his plan of Daniel's 70 weeks in that, seven, that, that 70th week or that final seven years. But it's not until the church age is over. The Bible um, then goes on in the New Testament to talk about the times of the Gentiles. That's a phrase you should remember, um, which will end with the rapture of the church, at which point the church is taken out of the way. God will then again turn his attention to the Jews and to Israel and will restart the clock to begin the final week of Daniel's prophecy. Um, so Jesus was rejected by his own people. Let me, let me go through a few scriptures to sort of, I wanna make sure you understand, I'm not just making this stuff up. The Jews were blinded. Isaiah 53, the prophet told, this is what was gonna happen prophetically, Isaiah said. In Isaiah 53, three and four, he said, and we, the Jews, hid as it were our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. We didn't esteem him as the Messiah. That was prophetically. Later on, John the Apostle in John chapter one, verses 10 and 11, um, it says he, Jesus, was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not, but he came into his own and his own received him not. Who are his own? The Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't a surfer from Southern California, as it turns out. <laughs> I know some of your pictures you had when your children. Um, no, he was a Jew. So he came to his own and his own received him not. That's the Jews rejecting the Messiah. And then again in Romans 11, 25, um, uh, Paul the apostle rem reminds the Gentiles, the Romans, he says, listen, don't be ignorant and don't be arrogant about the Jews. What? Well, let me read you Romans eleven twenty five. 25. He says, for I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That's the arrogance part. He says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So it makes sense. Right now, Israel, the Jews, largely around the world, there's a part blindness that has happened to them. They do not see Jesus as the true Messiah. But the church, we saw it. And it's gonna be when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then it says all of Israel will be saved. What, a, what an amazing plan. God's not done with the Jews. The Jews are in a place of blindness and we are living in the church age. The, some of the church has arrogantly, it says, be not ignorant, be not arrogant. The church has arrogantly said, we replace the Jews. God doesn't love the Jews anymore. And the church is replaced. It's called replacement theology, where we believe God replaced the Jews with the church. All of the Catholics, now, if you're a Catholic, you were never taught this because they don't teach this stuff. But if you go to like a Catholic seminary, you'll learn, oh, wow, we believe God's done with the Jews. Um, that's why, by the way, have you ever noticed that like the Pope is always a little bit um, against Israel uh, as a nation? And he's always a little more pro-Arab and it's a little weird. You're like, man, shouldn't the Pope be kind of pro-Israel because that's where Jesus came from? Well, the reason they have that in a lot of the Presbyterian church and others, they believe God's done with the Jews. They're no longer God's chosen people. We have replaced them. Horrible, horrible teaching, and I'll tell you why. God does not break his covenants with the Jews. Some of the covenants he made were conditional, but the big ones, like the Abrahamic covenant, was a one-sided covenant that God made with the Jews, and he's not gonna go back on his promise. Um, so what happens? The Jews are blinded and they reject Jesus is the Messiah. And so the church age begins and God sort of pivots to the Gentile church. Romans 10, 19. But I say to you, um, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you, the Jews, to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you. What? The Jews, Mo Moses even prophesied. Um, and then Paul would quote Moses on this in Romans chapter 10, that, that what would happen is the Jews would reject the Messiah and then these foolish nations would receive him. Who's the foolish nations? That's us, as it turns out. We're the foolish ones being talked about here. Um, and by foolish people, the Jews would be angered. What, what's that like? Well, it's a little bit like this. The Jews sit there today and wonder, what are you Christians about and why do you like us? Like, why do you even care about us? 
It's funny because the Jews don't have a thing called evangelism. No, there's no Jews going out there saying, become a Jew. Um, Jews are just Jews by ethnicity, but also where they, their inheritance of their parents and all that. But <clears throat> it's a whole nother deal. Um, but meanwhile, the Jews have these people on the earth that say, we love you guys. And by the way, you're God's chosen people, people like me. I got to have dinner uh, a while back with Yair Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu's son. And we were talking and, and he was trying to convince me, you know, I'm really glad he said that you guys love Israel. And, and then he was trying to reinforce that. Brett, you guys really need to love Israel because, and I was like, oh, this will be interesting. Because, you know, Yair's a nice guy, I love him. He's, he's a secular Jew. He's like, you guys need to love Israel because we're your only friend in the whole Middle East. I'm like, well, that's true, thank you, but that's not why we love you. Well, well, because we have technology and science and, and uh, Israel's leading the charge. Yep, that's right. It's not why we love you. Um, and he kept going in with these reasons why Americans should support Israel. But I, I was actually, you know, why, you know why the evangelical church in America largely supports Israel? Because you're God's chosen people. God has a plan for you and he loves you and that's why you're prospering. That's why the Jews are gathering in your land today and becoming this powerful nation. That's why on May 14th, 1948, you became a nation again and because God is unfolding his plan and we Gentile Christians, we're excited because we see your holy scriptures being fulfilled even in front of our faces. And he kind of looked at me with this blindness stare and he's like, oh, okay. Anyway, um, and, uh, and blindness in part. So God turned to the Gentiles. It's called the church age, Romans 10, 19. Acts 13, 46 uses this exact language. In Acts 13, 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, the Jews. But seeing that you put it from you or put it away from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul had to preach to the Jews and say, we're turning to the Gentiles because they're the ones who believe in Jesus, the Messiah. Now, so first I told you the Jews are blind, so God would turn to the Gentiles. But when the fullness of the Gentiles come in and the rapture of the church happens, guess what God's gonna do? He's gonna turn his attention back to the Jews, and we have scripture references for that. Jot down Romans eleven fifteen says, for if the casting away of them, the Jews, be the reconciling of the whole world, that's what happened. Because the Jews were sort of cast away for a while, the whole Gentile world has the opportunity to be saved by the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. That's what it says. Then it says, what shall the receiving of them, those the Jews, but life from the dead? See, Romans eleven fifteen says, the Jews were put aside, and seemingly dead, but they're gonna be brought back to life after the Gentiles come in. And do you remember in Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones? All these little bones, and they started scooting on the ground, and then the knee bone connected to the thigh bone, and the thigh bone connected to the, and remember we saw the, the skeletons walking around with no life in them? It's a great story in Ezekiel. It's talking about how God is gathering the Jews back together in their unbelief. See, they're not in belief right now, they're still sinful but they are gathering like God wants them to, but there's no f spirit within them. They're just skeletons is the, is the Ezekiel example. And when will that life be breathed in? When will the Jews come back to life and see that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, I already told you, you know, uh, Romans eleven twenty five says, don't be ignorant, don't be arrogant. Um, God's gonna, you know, keep working through the Gentiles. And then when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then Romans chapter 11, verse 26 says, and so all of Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. They shall turn around ungodliness from Jacob. And for this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. That's following Daniel's. Remember the six things we went over that the millennial kingdom's gonna bring in? This is where Paul says, guess what? That's gonna happen. God's gonna take away their sin when is that gonna happen? When the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then all of Israel is gonna be saved. That's this final seven year period that God has determined upon the Jews and upon the holy city, Jerusalem. Are you guys still with me? Uh, some of you are like, no, that's okay. Uh, just keep ch chugging away. Maybe you'll, it's, it's kind of important. So, so God will turn back to the Jews. Revelation chapter seven um, talks about how the Jews are gonna have the, the name of God sealed in their forehead during the tribulation period. Revelation 6 through 19 is the tribulation period in the book of Revelation. 
And during that time, the Jews are gonna have a mark on their forehead. Does that sound familiar, a mark on the forehead? Did you know Satan is only a duplicator and an imitator? Uh, the mark of the beast is just an imitation of what God's gonna do with the Jews during the tribulation period, that seven year period. He's gonna mark on their forehead and, and it says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed in their forehead and they were sealed 144,000 um, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So what's gonna happen? During the tribulation, these Jews are gonna be sealed for God. Um, who are the 144,000? Well, as it turns out, it's Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you laugh because the ridiculousness of that is pretty funny. And if you get these Watchtower people coming with their magazines in front of your house, hey, you know, we're the 144,000. Say, and which tribe of Israel are you from? Because it says they're from the tribes of Israel. Now what they'll answer if they, if they know their Jehovah's Witness doctrine, we're the lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> Wrong. They are not. They're just Jehovah's Witness. Um, you know, and from Brooklyn, the, the Watchtower Society is, uh, it's, it's a long story, but um, they've got it way wrong there. The Bible says those 144,000 are gonna be Jews in the tribulation period, and they're gonna have the seal of God in their forehead, and they're gonna be of each tribe. It even goes on in chapter seven and lists them. 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000, and it goes on and lists, they're Jews from the tribes of Israel. God's gonna save them in the tribulation period. So back to our little timeline here. And by the way, uh, let me just say this. If you, some of you wanna dive a little deeper, um, there, there, there's a book that was published way back in 1895, that's really awesome, uh, by a guy named Sir Robert Anderson. And he wrote a brilliant book called The Coming Prince. And uh, even though it's an old book, it, it, it does two things that are really outstanding. One, it defends the authorship of the book of Daniel as being legitimate from Daniel himself. It's one of the things the secularists the, uh, the atheist says, the book of Daniel is a forgery. There's no way they could have known all these things, these details about like when Jesus would ride in Jerusalem. There's no way. So that it must have been written in AD 90. And we've talked about that argument. But Sir Robert Anderson's Coming Prince in 19, 1895 uh, d defends the authorship, but it also clearly establishes the historical accuracy of the fulfillment of this timeline that I've kind of presented today. Um, and it talks about the first coming of Christ, the Palm Sunday road, but it's also gonna talk about the rapture of the church and the second coming. And I think that's what makes this really, really powerful. So let's talk about this. Now, we know that we're living in the church age. The end or the fullness of the Gentiles is gonna come with the rapture of the church. That's why I believe that's the next event that's gonna happen. The rapture of the church. And there's an imminence there. We don't know when it's gonna happen. See, the orange line there is a variable. And I need to say this because it's, it is a little funny that you know, Jesus told them, you could have known the very day when I was coming, they're in the, in the, riding into Jerusalem. You could have known the very day. So there's a bunch of harebrained prophecy buffs that go and say, well, they knew the day then, we should know the day when he comes in his second coming. Or we know the very day when the rapture, and you get these crazy people like, remember Harold Camping? The reason Harold Camping bugged me, this was what, like 10 years ago? I don't remember when it was. But he came out saying, the rapture of the church or the end of the world's coming on September 21st. And whenever he said that, the thing that really bugged me is I never heard of Harold Camping until CNN said, Christians believe, as it turns out, that the end of the world is coming September 21st. Well, let's see if that happens. Let's see if Christians are right. And the funny thing is, all of you and me, none of us had ever heard of this guy, Harold Camping. And as it turns out, he maybe was out in the woods a little too long, camping or whatever, I don't know. But he was wacko. And we, we as Christians, all the Christians that I knew were like, yeah, he's been drinking his bath water. Like wacko, crazy. And meanwhile, CNN presented him, this is what Christians believe. Watch out for that, by the way. They use the craziest people to sort of represent Christianity and what we believe. Um, so... The, the truth is no man knows the day or the hour of two things, the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. Nobody knows when that's gonna happen. And we know that because Jesus said that. So Jesus did say, oh, you could have known the day I was riding into Jerusalem, but Jesus also said, you will not know the day or the hour when I return. So if you hear somebody predicting dates of the end of the world, the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ, you can just count them off as wacko, okay? If I start saying, I think there's a date, to say Brett's wacko and we're going to another church. Um, and I've always said that, by the way. So, uh, enough of that. Well, okay, so 
We haven't really defined what this final seven year period is gonna be, but this book of ours of ours and our text tells us. Let's zoom in to the seven year period called the tribulation period in the Bible elsewhere. Um, it's also called the time of Jacob's trouble. What's the tribulation? What's the point of this seven year period? I already gave you the point of the other periods, the 49 years you know, to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. The other years was the scattering of the Jews and the diaspora. Um, you know, uh, when Jesus was rejected, there's all purpose there. What's the purpose of the tribulation period? Two things, number one, God's wrath poured out upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. That's the first objective of the tribulation. Read Revelation 6 or 19. God's gonna pour out his wrath. It's called the time of the wrath of the lamb. Some of you are like, I'm not afraid of that. The wrath of the lamb? <laughs> like, is that really a scary thing? Oh, yeah, after son, Jesus was the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, but he's coming as a conqueror. You have to understand that. So it's time of wrath of God pouring out on Christ rejecting sinful world. The second objective of the tribulation is to wake up the Jews where they will see that they'd missed it, that Jesus really is the Messiah. And Daniel gives us some detail on the seven years. Let's revisit verse 27 real quick. We're almost done. It says in verse 27, and he, this coming world leader during this tribulation period, he shall confirm the covenant um, or a covenant as your margin reads, with many for one week, for seven years, there's gonna be a peace treaty with the Jews and maybe with the Arab-Israeli conflict or whatever, but this Antichrist is gonna come and broker a peace agreement with the Jews during this time period. And for the first three and a half years of that, it's gonna, it's gonna go really seemingly well. It says he'll confirm the covenant and in the midst of that week, in the middle of the seven year period, it says, he, this world leader, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. Now you say, that sounds familiar. Do you guys remember talking about the abomination of desolation? And we talked about the foreshadow of Antiochus Epiphanes spreading pig's blood on the temple in Jerusalem in 170-ish BC. Remember that whole story? The Maccabean revolt? Well, that was a foreshadow of coming attractions. Well, Brett, I believe that Daniel's prophesying about Antiochus Epiphanes, the thing you talked about, and that was fulfilled during this, this, uh, this time. The problem with that is you got a little problem with Jesus. Because remember in Matthew 24, Jesus, when the disciples had tell us about the end of the world, and Jesus went on in like three pages, red letters, talked about the end of the world. One of the things he said in that time is coming that Daniel the prophet spoke of called the abomination of desolation. Jesus said it hadn't happened yet, even though Antiochus was like 170 BC. Are you seeing the problem there? Some people try to say, oh, this was already fulfilled back in the uh, you know, Seleucids and the Ptolemies and all that stuff. No, 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 no. Um, but what's gonna happen is it says in the middle of that week, this world leader is gonna do something. Now, so this is where we have to chop the seven years and a half. Uh, we got three and a half years and three and a half years. And by the way, when Jesus talked about this in uh, Matthew 24, he gave a name for the second three and a half period. Does anybody know what that's called? Right, the great tribulation. The whole thing's called the tribulation, but if you hear the reference of the great tribulation, that's the last three and a half years. It's gonna enter into another level. So the beginning of this seven year period, I believe begins, the rapture of the church happens, and then a bunch of things kick into gear. A coming world leader comes on the scene. Globalism, one world religion, one world government, it's all formed. They rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and, and I believe that peace treaty, by the way, is gonna be the thing that this world leader is gonna make so that he can have a temple to defile. It says right here, he's gonna go in and cause the sacrifice to cease and he's gonna commit the abomination of desolation. Now, if you wanna read what that is, Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24. Um, it's also referred to there in Revelation 13, where he's gonna set up an image for himself to be worshiped. Um, uh, and, uh, and by the way, you know, um, the thing that's kind of interesting about this, what, what is the event that causes all the trouble in the middle of the tribulation? It's that event called the abomination of desolation. And that's where he goes into the temple to be worshiped, sets up an image, uh, and, uh, and then, then the Jews in the middle of the tribulation, the Jews will say, wait a minute. We signed a deal with the devil. Little they know, literally, they signed a deal with the devil and, and, and the treaty is now bad and it will be in the middle of the tribulation that he will make war against the Jews and that's when the Jews are gonna realize Jesus is the Messiah. 
um, and all of Israel will be saved during that time period. Um, so, so by the way, the three and a half year thing is not just here in Daniel's in the middle of the week, but do you remember we went over these scriptures a few weeks ago? Revelation 12, 14 talks about time, times, and a half time. And that's the three and a half years. Revelation 12, 6 talks about, you know, 1,260 days. And Revelation 13, 5 talks about 42 months. Um, we've covered that recently. All these pieces are fitting together and it really explains how it's gonna happen. Now what happens, once this goes on, the Antichrist, this world leader, is gonna make war against the Jews and it's gonna reach a horrible pitch and the Jews are gonna be hanging by a thread and what's gonna happen at the end of the seven year periods while Israel's hanging by a thread and the Jews are being threatened by this world leader, the second coming of Christ. Christ is gonna come at the end of the tribulation period, the, the second coming of Christ. The rapture of the church, by the way, is not a coming. People get confused by that. We, we meet him up in the air, the Bible says. But we, where do we go during this time? During the tribulation, the, the rapture of the church happens, we get to be up in heaven. How long are we gonna be in heaven? Seven years is correct from the earth's perspective. But who are we gonna be with when we're in heaven? Jesus! And the Bible says, remember, Second Peter, a day with the Lord is as what? a thousand years and a thousand years with the Lord is as a day. Who knows how long we'll be in heaven before we, from the heavenly perspective, now your brain's starting to short circuit a little bit, um, <laughs> but we'll be up in heaven for a while. And then, and then the second coming of Christ, who comes with Christ? We do, he comes with 10,000s of his saints. That's gonna be at the end of the tribulation back at the hall of justice on earth. He returns, we return with him and he's gonna, crush the, the, uh, the world's kingdoms, Daniel chapter two, stone that rolls down the mountain. He's gonna crush those kingdoms and set up his everlasting kingdom, which is verse 24, those six things, end of transgression, end of sin, the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, that's the kingdom where Christ comes and rules and reigns for a thousand years. That's gonna be a glorious thing. Now you say, Brett, okay, I've got a headache. Uh, can we go now? Yes, in just a minute, but let's step back just for a second. Let's just say this. This 490 years, the seven, do you see how amazing this is? I gotta tell you, there's, this does two things that I wanna say, two things. Number one, isn't the Bible amazing? Like this isn't something some man could have just made up and said, we're gonna make this work out and you know, it'll just be, what a coincidence, those dates all worked out when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And, and yet, the first part of this has come to pass to the, to the perfect date. But the second part of this, which would be the last seven years, that's still yet to happen. And that, that 70th week is coming. And I believe it could be coming right around the corner. The, the other things the Bible says that lead up to that tribulation period, where we're seeing the pieces. You might think the world is falling apart right now. If you read your Bible, it's actually everything's falling into place. Everything's falling into place. And we're seeing this come to pass. So the first thing, I, I just love the Bible. I just gotta say that. I love God's word. It's living and powerful. You know, here's this book written over a 1500 year period, 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages, but it's this integrated message system that reveals God's plan and purpose for all of humanity. It's not just a, your dumb professor in college that said, the Bible is just a good book of literature. That's ridiculous. He hasn't read his Bible, or at least he hasn't taken a hard look at it. When you read a prophecy like the 70 weeks of Daniel, like only God can do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is some of you guys are like, Brad, that's great, you're a pre-tribber. I don't know what I believe. I'm a pre-trib, post-trib, ah mill, saw mill, whatever. I'll just follow whatever. I'm a pan-tribber, I'm just all gonna pan out in the end. Well, can I tell you the problem with that? The Bible says don't, don't be ignorant about the end times. The Bible says that you're to watch and be ready and wait. And, and, and the thing about this, um, the pre-trib view, um, let me just ask you a couple questions and then we'll wrap it up. The first question is, where was the church of Jesus Christ in the first 483 years of Daniel's 70 week prophecy? Where was the church, anybody? Nowhere. The church didn't exist in the first 483 years. We were not, and just like God said through Gabriel, Daniel, this is determined upon Israel and your holy city, Jerusalem. So we weren't in the first 143 years. Why then would we be in the 70th week? Why would the church be in the 70th week of Daniel? And my answer is we're not gonna be. The church age is not given to the 70 week prophecy of Daniel. That was for the Jews and for Israel. 
the church is gonna be taken out. And God is gonna take his church, the bride of Christ. And does it make sense if you know God, would God pull out his bride before he pours out his wrath? I mean, if he doesn't, that's kind of abusive. He's like an abusive husband. That's not God. Um, the, the Lord says, I will never destroy the righteous with the wicked. That's why I pulled Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah um, before the, the, the you know, fire and brimstone came down. Even the flood. Did you know there was somebody raptured right before the flood? Who was that, anybody? Enoch, little dude that walked with God, pleased God. And then it says, the Lord took him up and he didn't see death. That's, that's a picture of the rapture. Well, Brett, I believe we're like Noah. We're pictured by Noah who goes through the flood and God protects them in the ark. A nice try, but Noah is a perfect example of the Jews. They're gonna have to go through the tribulation. God will protect the Jews through that time and he's got a plan for them. But they're in the flood, if you would, the tribulation because of their own rebellion. But the church who accepts Christ and believes in Jesus, we're saved. And that's why Jesus said, pray that you be counted worthy to escape these things. That's what we need to be. That's what we need to do. Escape. Well, Brett, you're just trying to escape the, the tribulation. Yes, good eye. <laughs> you're totally right. Um, now, let me say something. There's a false narrative. Some of the, the people say, well, Brett, you're just, you just think that you're not, that's arrogant for you to think you're not gonna go through hard times. Did I say that? I didn't say that. The church could go through horrible times before the rapture of the church. We could go through things that make the Holocaust look like going to Disneyland. That could still happen, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying we're gonna be saved from all that. Jesus even talked about the ramping up toward the end. That could very well happen. I know that's kind of bad news, but, but you have to understand the tribulation period, Jesus said it'll be the worst time that will ever have been on the earth. So that's the worst of the worst. I don't wanna be a part of that. And guess what? Because you're the bride of Christ, I'm the bride of Christ, the church, the, the Lord takes us up. We have the marriage feast of the lamb in heaven. Meanwhile, the wrath of God is poured out on a Christ rejecting sinful world and he's gonna wake up the Jews. That's what's gonna happen. That's a glorious thing. I'm so thankful that I'm part of the bride of Christ. You can be too. If you're not, if you're not saved, you gotta accept Christ. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that you're a sinner. Repent of your sins, believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. And, and if you believe that and accept that, the Lord says, I'll forgive you. And, and you'll be beloved and you'll be saved by my grace through faith. What a glorious truth. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that's living and powerful. We're always impressed by the scriptures, Lord, and I just pray that you'd give us that great hope of your return. Lord, you tell us he who has this hope purifies himself. Lord, I pray that your church, well, we wouldn't be messing around with sin in these last days, but instead, Lord, that we would be hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and like Daniel, going about the king's business. So bless as we continue our study through Daniel. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's all stand together. Well, we'll pick up Daniel chapter 10 coming up uh, Wednesday night. We'll see you then. Lord bless you, you're dismissed.